Hey guys, Coach Sharf here. Welcome back to our videos on our Algebra 1 EOC packet. We are picking back up in the functions domain, starting on page three of the functions domain. Um, so what I'm gonna do with this video, I looked ahead at a few pages and uh, if you can see on these first couple problems, yeah, we actually already did them in the equations domain. So you can go back and look at already doing those and kind of skip them. Um, or just kind of rewrite the answers on here. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and move on down. So looking at, I'm going to try to do at least four pages on this one. We'll kind of see where time is, maybe do more. Because um, some of these only got a couple questions on them, things like that. So let's just go ahead and get jump in and get started. All right, so looking at this key idea about working with functions is particularly talking about um, you could find key features. It says interpret the specific quantitative relationship regardless of the demand or presentation. Um, so it's basically saying what's the function trying to tell you, okay? Let's talk about key features as you can see below. Uh, there could be key features when you graph it, you know, such as uh, domain, range, x-intercept, y-intercept, things like that. Um, there can also be key features even when you just have as the equation as we have below. So that's what we're going to kind of explore this problem. And then we'll look at some graphs uh, going forward. So what are the key features of this function? Well, what can you tell me just based on looking at this function? Well, it's written in slope-intercept form, right? So you tell me the slope or m is one half, right? That's the slope. The y-intercept is negative three, okay? You know, y-intercept right here, b, okay? I don't. I wrote y-intercept instead of b, but it's negative three, right? Okay, can we get the x-intercept? Okay, we can, okay? How, well, how do we get the x-intercept? Okay, I would have a, let's think about what the x-intercept is, okay? Again, if you kind of draw a graph, if we have right here, we'll say that that's, three, zero, right? We have a value for x, but our y is zero. Px, f of x, whatever, it's the same as y, right? So this actually needs to be zero over here. So I'm gonna have zero equals one half x minus three. And then you can just do the algebra to solve it. I add three to both sides. It's gonna give me three equals one half x, okay? So one half of x is three. You should probably be able to tell me what x, the x-intercept is just from here, but if you want to do the math, really I would multiply both sides by two. It would cancel out the one half there. Multiply that by two, and x would be six. So that would be my x intercept is six or six zero. Okay. Um, so that's just the basics from the function. But again, even if you really think about it, a uh, bigger picture, just drop my pen, sorry. I'm trying to get it. Well, not moving my camera too much. Um, Think about bigger picture again. This is the equation of a line, right? So if I draw a quick coordinate plane, unless it's a, a vertical line or horizontal line, okay, any line I draw, so we could draw a line there, draw a line there, whatever. As long as it's not straight up and down or straight across vertical or horizontal, okay? This is gonna be covering every X value going from left to right and every y value, this would be going up this way and every y value going down this way, okay? This line, same thing. It's not going as, this one's more vertical, so it's not going as much left and right, but still I could, this would still continue to go left as I drew it down. This would still continue going right as I drew it up. And of course, again, it's also going up and down. So um, it's not, though. if it were a function where it was a vertical or horizontal line, it would just be, x equals five or y equals three, something like that. Since it's not that, since I know it's the equation of the line, I could derive from that that the domain is negative infinity to positive infinity, same with the range, okay? There's a couple more things we could take away from this, but you've probably seen better with graphs, even though I kind of sketched it out here anyway. So we'll kind of stop there, but then we'll flip to the next page and look at some graphs, okay? All right, so to rent a canoe, the cost is $3 for the oars and life preserver plus $5 an hour for the canoe. Which graph 
models the cost of renting a canoe. So this is what you gotta kind of think about, okay? Costs three dollars for the oars and the life preserver. So you gotta pay three dollars for the oars and the life preserver, even if you go out in a canoe for a minute, turn around, come back in, right? Plus five dollars an hour. Okay. So which graph models that cost? So first thing you gotta think about is Um, since they're not marked, which axis represents what, right? So you got cost, right? Cost and time because it's five, five dollars an hour, right? So do y'all think time would be counting by fives? Would you think we would be out there for 25 hours or would it be more reasonable to be out there for maybe two hours, four hours, whatever. Okay. Probably be more reasonable for this to be my time and this to be my cost, right? So that kind of helps us label it. So the cost is starting at $3, okay? So when time is zero, it's still gonna cost me $3. So we gotta kind of look at what, which graph kind of starts at three. And if you look at them, this one's starting at zero. This one looks like it's starting at five. This one is between zero and five, so that might be three. And again, this one looks like it's starting at five, right? Um, so then it costs $5 an hour. So for every hour, you're going up $5. Okay, if you look, the time is in intervals of two hours. So for every two hours, if it's $5 an hour, two hours would be $10. So for every, every two hours you go over, the line should go up cost should go up by 10. If we kind of look here, this kind of looked like what ours was, right? If we go up here to two, that kind of looks like it's about 213, right? If we go up here to four, kind of looks like 423, all right? So our answer here is C, okay? Um, if you actually kind of compare it to slope here is right, okay? If you look, I've got 00, 210, 420, but it doesn't have that built-in $3 cost, okay? This one kind of flipped it. It started out with a cost of five and it was only going up three every two hours. Okay, you got two, 11, four, 17. Okay, so that one had flipped the two numbers basically. All right, this one's been a flat cost of $5. Doesn't matter if you're out for two, four, six, eight, ten 10 hours, it's telling you the cost was only $5, which is incorrect. Okay, all right, next one. Juan and Patty, I think we already had this problem too, actually. But I'll go ahead and go through it. Juan and Patty decided to see who could read more books in a month. They began to keep track after Patty already had five books. We definitely already had this one, but I'll go ahead and do it. They began to keep track after Patty already read five books that month. This graph shows the number of books Patty read for the next 10 days and the rate at which she will read for the rest of the month. So the day they started tracking, she had already read five books, right? If you kind of look... Um, after two days, she's in the middle. What's in the middle? Five and ten, seven and a half, right? After four days, she's up to ten. So in four days, she's read five more books, right? So it's kind of the same slope, all right? So one here kind of halfway, right? If this is seven and a half, okay, what's halfway between five and seven and a half? It'd be 6.25, okay? So she's gone from five to 6.25 in one day. So she's actually going up, if you work out the math, she's going up one, she's reading 1 1.25 books a day, okay? Uh, there we go. If you multiply that out, that gives you two and a half books in two days. It gives you, because you're going five to seven and a half, five to 10, she's read five books in four days, right? If you multiply that out, that works, okay? Juan does not start to read any books before day four. And he starts reading at the same rate as Patty for the rest of the month. How many books will he read on day 12? Okay. So again, it's, we looked at this problem earlier and it's kind of hard to tell. It's, it's wanting you to do eight days. Okay. So we're going to do 11 and then 12, right? If we're starting on day four. We're going up 1.25 books a day. So it's basically two and a half books every 
two days. So we would go here, 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 and here. All right, so if we carry it across, that's going to be 10, all right? So starts reading on day four, and it says by day 12. It doesn't say at through the end of day 12, so up until day 12. So again, that, if you go on one to count it out, it would be day four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 11, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight days. Eight times that would still be 10, so it would be 10, okay? Again, that could be... You can also do just 12 minus 4. Some people, the catch with that is some people might count day 4 and day 12, which would give me 9 days. So that's kind of the catch with that one. If y'all remember, I talked about that when we did it previously. All right. So now key ideas. This is different features of graphs, right? We got x-intercepts, root, or zero. We talked about that. I told y'all x-intercept, root, zero, all means the same thing, okay? Y-intercepts, when a function is increasing, so that's... Again, it says what it says there. Basically, as you're going from left to right, the graph is going up, okay? It's decreasing of if you're going from left to right, the graph is going down. Every quadratic has a minimum or maximum, which is located at the vertex, the lowest or highest point, all right? End behavior, again, each, uh, as the ends of the graph approach, go to negative infinity x and positive infinity y, are they going up or down? We didn't really talk about that one a lot. Uh, you do need to know it, though, because you will see it in Algebra 2. Uh, domain, all the x values, range is all the y values, although it doesn't, range is not in here. Rate of change, this is one we didn't really get to. When you have a quadratic graph or a graph that is not a straight line, it's basically, um, if you look, okay, the rate of change for the graph, it's, you know, it's not going up as much here, so... You going from here to here, there's not as much change. So from zero or one to three, but from three to five, you're going up a lot more, right? So it's basically, um, the rate of change is calculating the slope between these two points if it were actually a straight line and not a curve line. Okay, the slope between these two points. So it's calculating the slope between two points on a graph. That's basically what the rate of change is, okay? All right, so... We got a couple parabolas, and we talked about this, right? Parabolas have the shape when a is greater than zero, when a is positive, right? So when it's positive, it faces up. When a is negative, it points down, okay? All right. So we have a quadratic function, okay? A ball is thrown into the air from a height of four feet at time t of zero. The function that models the situation is h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 63 t plus four, where t is measured in seconds and h is the height in feet, okay? So this is where we're gonna have to do a lot of calculations here and I'm gonna have to get out a separate sheet of paper, okay? Um, a is pretty easy. What's the height of the ball after two seconds? So basically I just gotta plug in two for here, right? So it's going to be negative 16 times 2 squared plus 63 times 2 plus 4. If you do all that math, again, you have to square this first. Multiply negative 16 times 4 plus 63 times 2 plus 4. It's going to be 126 minus 64, which is 62, plus 4 is 66 feet. Okay. When will the ball reach a height of 50 feet? So this is this is gonna be a little more tricky and I might have to do work at the bottom of the paper for this one, okay? So our height is 50, right? So we gotta do 50 on this side of the equation. So negative 16t squared plus 63t plus four. So now it's just a matter of solving this quadratic, okay? I actually got to subtract 50 from both sides, all right? Give me zero equals negative 16t squared plus 63t minus 46, okay? Um, optionally, if this will make you more comfortable, if you, if you think about it, if you multiplied all this by negative one, sorry for the background noise, if you multiply all this by negative one, you would 
change all the signs, okay? So you could do that, but you could also just leave them like this as the negatives to um, stick in the quadratic formula, okay? I'm just gonna leave them like this to stick in the quadratic formula, all right? So if we remember the quadratic formula, it should be on our formula sheet. Pull that out for the first time today. Where is it? There we go. All right. So it's negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. We get a, b, and c from standard form. All right. So a is negative 16, b is 63, c is negative 46. So I'm going to plug it in the quadratic formula. So I've got negative... 63 plus or minus the square root of 63 squared minus 4 times negative 16 times negative 46 all over 2 times negative 16. Fine with numbers. All right, so It's going to be negative 16 plus or minus the square root. Let's see if I can do 63 squared in my head. It would be 189. Then it would be 3780. So it should be 3969. Did I do that right? Let me see. 63 squared. 3969. All right, look at Coach Sharf. All right, so 3969 minus, let's see here. All right, so we got negative four times negative 16 times negative 46. I've got one, two, three negatives I'm multiplying. So my answer is gonna wind up being negative, all right? Let's see if I can do this one, man. Four times 16 is of course 64. So 64 times 46, all right? So you multiply by six would be 384. And then you multiply by four. 4D would be 40 technically, it would be 2560, 384 would be 2944. You know, I probably should just punch these in the calculator so I turn it in my head. But I got it right, 2944, all right? All right, over. 2 times negative 16, which is negative 32, all right? So again, you could do more math here. If you subtract that, it's going to be 1,025. So negative 63 plus or minus the square root of 1,025, okay? Over 32. So let's see here. What is the square root of 1,025? 32.01, okay? So it's basically 32, so I got negative 63 plus 32 over 32, and then I've got negative 63 minus 32 over 32, okay? So it's actually negative 32. So I gotta divide it, it's gonna turn into positive. All right, so if you actually look here, that's gonna give me, if you if you kind of know your numbers, if I multiply 60, 32 times two, that would get 64. It's pretty close to this, okay? So I can, I can go ahead and tell you just looking at it now, it's gonna be about one second, three seconds, okay? If you combine those, that's negative 31 over 32, negative 32. Down here would be negative 95 over negative 32. Those are gonna be just under one second, just under three seconds. So the negatives cancel out, so I'm just gonna divide that. It gives me point nine six. Let's go ahead and round it up to nine. This should be 2.969, I believe. Yeah. So 2.969. So you got 0.969 and 2.969 seconds, okay? You can almost round it up to one second, three seconds. It would almost kind of depend on um, 
in multiple choice answers, to be honest. But we did the math, so we, get, we got the specifics. All right. What's the maximum height of the ball? Okay. So if y'all remember for this one, to get the maximum height, okay, I'd have to get the... Uh, the time it would take to be the maximum time. So that would just be the negative B over 2A, okay? That's the, the vertex formula, right? Again, remember the max maximum or minimum is the vertex, just depends on if it's up or down, right? So I'm gonna have negative 63 over two times negative 16 which is 63 over 32, negative 63 over negative 32, which should turn out positive. So that's actually gonna be, again, you can divide it, but that's gonna be 1.969 seconds, okay? So that's the time it would take to reach the maximum height. Now to actually get the maximum height, we would need to plug it in here. Okay, so I would do negative 16 times 1.9, I'll just round it 1.97 actually, make it a little easier squared. I really could round it to two, be close enough, but plus 63 times 1.97 plus four. So you gotta do all that math. Let me punch that in the calculator real quick. So y'all can see it. I'm gonna have negative 16 times 1.97 squared. 63 times 1.97 plus four. Gives me a height of 66.01 feet. Okay. Again, if you look, it's basically the same answer we got up here because after two seconds, it was 66 feet. So 1.969 seconds is just before two seconds. So we can see that it should be pretty close. I apologize about the ice machine. All right, part D, when would the ball hit the ground? So when it hits the ground, what's the height? Height is zero, right? So, it's gonna give me a height of zero. All right, so H is gonna be zero. So negative 16 T squared plus 63 T plus four. So basically we gotta do the same thing we did down here, okay? Um, this is A, this is B, this is C. If we set up the quadratic formula, it'd be negative 63 plus or minus the square root of 63 squared minus four times negative 16 times positive four over two times negative 16. So I'm gonna kind of bring this down here further. All right, it's gonna give me negative 63 plus or minus the square root. I already did 63 squared was 39. 69. Now, negative four times negative 16 times positive four, okay? I've got two negatives, so it doesn't multiply and be positive. You could do four times 16 times four in your calculator, but again, you know, just the way I think four times four is 16, now I have 16 times 16, which is positive 256. So plus 256 goes down here. Over, still have negative 32 on the bottom. All right, if we add that, it's going to be the square root of 42, 25. Did I do that right? 39, 69 plus 256. Okay, yeah. I believe that's actually a perfect square. Let me take the square root of it in my calculator. So I'm going to do second. Square root, second. If y'all know how to pull up the previous answer when you're doing something like this, it's second, and then the negative sign. You hit that, it gives you the answer. I'm taking the square root of the previous answer, which is 42.25, which is 65. Okay, so. I got negative 63 plus or minus 65 over negative 32, right? Okay, so... If I do the adding, all right, it's gonna give me two over negative 32, which is negative 1 16th. Why is it negative 1 16th? Well, remember we started a height of four feet, right? So if we went backwards in time, 
one sixteenth of a second started at four feet, it would go. Let me just kind of draw a little pro. Okay. Just that. All right. So if we started here, if y'all could tell, it's a little higher than hitting the ground at the bottom. So if we could go back in time backwards, it would touch the ground from where we start, right? Um, so that's where that one comes in. But of course, we don't want negative time. We want whatever time it would take to get there. So we got to do the other one. Negative 63 minus 65 over 32, negative 32, which is negative 128 over negative 32, which is actually going to be an even four seconds. All right, so that's going to be four seconds to hit the ground. What domain makes sense for the function? All right, so again, domain is our inputs. What are we inputting? What is our, what is we plugging in the equation? Time, all right? So what domain makes sense for the function? Well, I can't have negative time, right? We already talked about that. So I got to start at zero seconds. I can go up to four seconds, but then four seconds is when it's going to hit the ground. So... Again, when I write, I write this with the brackets, it's any time between zero and four. So it could be zero seconds, it could be half a second, it could be one and a quarter seconds, it could be 2.173 seconds, but anything between zero and four, okay? All right. The table shows the company's profit, P in thousands of dollars over time, T in months. Describe the average rate of change in terms of context, okay? So you got to compare what's the rate of change described, okay? You're going to get the rate of change. if you Again, if you kind of drew your chart, you would have time over here, profit over there, okay? So again, if you kind of think about it, you would have 3, 18 might be here, 7, 68 might be way up there, 10, and 123 might be way up there. So it's kind of going up like this, right? So it's how much, so we're gonna say, how is the profit increasing over time? Okay, how's the profit increasing over time? So that's what it's describing, okay? What is the average? Rate of change for the profit between three and seven months. All right. So, again, if you kind of said that this was X, this was Y, I got two ordered pairs, right? 318, 766. Like we said back there, to find the average rate of change, it's a little bit off, but you just use the slope formula. Okay. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So, for that one, all right, I'm going to put it over here on the side. So, we'll say that this is. Your second point, this is your first point. So Y2 minus Y1, 66 minus 18 over X2 minus X1, 7 minus 3, okay? So if you kind of work this out, oops, here we go. If we kind of work this out, it's going to be uh, 48 over 4, which is 12, okay? So we're going to say 12, all right? Now between three and 24 months. So again, we're using 318, and now we gotta use 24, 6, 27. So we could do that one down there. Again, Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. That's gonna give me, gotta bear down the paper real quick, 609 over 21. All right. Don't believe that one divides evenly. So let me punch in the calculator just to check. Oh, it does, 29, how about that? All right, so the average rate of change here is gonna be 29, okay? All right, a flying disc is thrown into the air from a height of 25 feet at time t0. The function that models the situation, h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 75 t plus 25, where t is measured in seconds and h is the height in feet. What values of t best describe the time when the disc is flying in the air? So this one, 
This one should hopefully be kind of, again, I don't like using the term common sense, but if you know what T is representing, you should be able to figure out. Okay, T is the number of seconds, right? So we're throwing a Frisbee. Okay. So is T the time in seconds between 0 and 5 seconds, 0 and 25 seconds? Is it all real numbers or all positive numbers? Okay. First thing, can't be all real numbers. Time can't be negative. Okay. All positive integers. So let's think about this. It means time could be one second. Time could be a thousand seconds. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen anything stay in the air for a thousand seconds. All right. Even birds, they get a, they kind of get tired. Um, maybe an airplane. Definitely an airplane. I, ho I hope an airplane. Because if an airplane couldn't stay in the air more than a thousand seconds, that's like 16, 16 minutes and 40 seconds, I think, if I did the math right mid. Anyway, um, so basically, is the disc going to be in the air between 0 and 5 seconds or 0 and 25 seconds? I mean, common, common sense would kind of dictate even that point A, right? Probably not going to see a Frisbee in the air for 25 seconds. Um, again, what you would do is you would plug it in here to see if you get a, a positive height. You can't get a negative height, right? If you plugged in... 25, you get negative 16 times 25 squared is 625 plus 75 times 25 plus 25. So that would be negative 10,000 plus. 76 times 25, which would be 1900. Yeah, so that one wouldn't work. So definitely would have to be A, okay? What is the end behavior of the graph f of x equals negative 0.25x squared minus 2x plus 1? So this kind of goes back to what we were showing over here, okay? If you think about a parabola, okay? Both ends are either going to be going up or both ends are going to be either going down, okay? You got to look at A. A is greater than zero, A is less than zero. It goes back again to our standard form. A is our coefficient on X. So A here, even though it's a decimal, it's still negative. That's still fine, okay? A is still negative. So A is still negative, all right? So it's gonna be this one, all right? So as the left side, goes to negative infinity x. So as x decreases, so as x is going to the left, x is getting smaller, y is decreasing, going down, right? Even as x gets bigger, as it goes to the right toward positive infinity x, y is still getting smaller, y is still decreasing, okay? So as x increases, f of x increases. That's, you know, that's incorrect, okay? As x increases, f of x decreases, well, that looks true, right? Even as x is going to the right, as x is increasing, f of x, my y, my function is decreasing, okay? Then as x decreases, f of x decreases, all right? So it is going to be b, okay? You don't even have to look at c and d. All right, so there are pages three through six. I will get this posted on YouTube and let y'all know, and we'll pick back up later. Until then, y'all take it easy.